are, I think, the, the right way to do a lot of this. And lawyers haven't picked up any of these things because like, the legal profession has been around for a thousand years, right? And programming has only been around for 50. So what if programming had been invented before law, right? How would the world look different? And I think that's the, the real disruption that we're trying to do. So I've been posting about this for a little while and Mark Andreessen, who basically invented the modern browser and venture capital and all this other stuff, he's on board with this idea. Why? Because he's also a programmer. So maybe in six months or in 12 months or in two years, I will go visit uh, Andreessen Horowitz and they will give me a bunch of money. So that would be cool. But for now, it's just an open source project. But you know, if you ask, what's the opportunity here, right? Open table makes a dollar every time somebody goes somewhere for dinner. That's their vision. And legalese maybe will make a dollar every time somebody somewhere signs a contract. Like it's, it's not inconceivable, right? Like Uber makes a dollar every time somebody goes from A to B. So maybe this will happen, maybe. But we don't want to sell to lawyers, right? With all due respect to our esteemed colleagues, this is the kind of disruption that sort of goes around the lawyers and goes straight to the end users. And the end users that I'm familiar with, they are entrepreneurs and they're investors and they're trying to do like a deal that's like $50,000 and they don't want to spend $10,000 on legal. So these are people who are underserved, they're not served at all. And I don't think I'm taking money away from lawyers going after this particular segment. And in fact, if I give them this tool, then I'm actually encouraging them to say, look, after using the tool, after developing all the PDFs, then take the PDFs to the lawyer and then get sign off, right? So that's 300 bucks that you wouldn't have made otherwise. So very specifically, I'm interested in workflows and I'm interested in legal operations. I'm not, I don't think of this as like, here's the Word doc or here's the single PDF that you need to sign. I think of this as here is the state vector of your company today and here's the state vector of your company where you want it to go tomorrow. And we are going to calculate the delta between those two vectors. And we are going to produce all of the patches and all of the diffs needed to patch from A to B. Does that make sense to the like programmers in the audience? It's like obvious, right? <laughs> Only for some reason. It's a simple matter of programming. Programming everything. Sure, but you only have to do it once. Lawyers are doing it all the time, every day. So anyway, the, the strategy here is if maybe we do get big, it'll end up being like, like YouTube is the place you go for video, Amazon is where you go for books, and maybe Legalese is where you go for legal. So maybe that's the, the future. But to get there, there's a fair amount of computer science needed. Like this is sort of what goes on behind the scenes. I don't know if it's big enough to see, but Basically, you go and you define your cap table in Google Spreadsheets. You go define the parties in Google Spreadsheets. All of this lives in your account. And then it, if you say, I want to go from here to there, it computes the dependency graph needed to do that. And then it produces all the documents needed to do that. So some of the programming has been done. Uh, maybe at this point, I will just skip out and show you What's what I've actually talked about here? That'd be useful. Any questions so far before I go into the what was that first paper you showed us? Demo. The first paper. Oh, that was Daniela's paper. Um, she wrote this a long time ago, but she had the idea to do a sort of visual interface for deal making. So in theory, right. like I lay out all of my negotiation positions and like this is acceptable, this is not acceptable. This is kind of the range of what I'm interested in. And if the other side does that too, then the software just basically says, okay, well, here is the thing that's between what you want, between what they want. Yeah, it could be. Just like find the overlap in this linear programming problem. Right? So she came, she's interested in visualization and she's on the team working with us on helping to bring a little bit of design visualization to all this. And like, this is how you can represent, here's what I want, these are my goals, and then I'm gonna 
I'm sitting on this side, you're sitting on that side, and we're going to move little blobs back and forth until we reach something that we agree to do together. So there's a lot of thinking around this. But you can only get to this kind of visualization if you do the formalization first. All right, and that's where I want to go with this. Today, there are all these really nice startups that um, Docracy. Have, has anybody here tried Docracy or um, Law Canvas or any of these? So these guys, they're nice. I like them. They're what I call like a version one startup because it's it's basically just like instead of Microsoft Word, here's an editor in your web browser, and these are the bits in yellow, and you have to go fill them in. And after you fill them in, you've got a flat template, but that's not formalization, right? That's just like a template. So M4 is like almost 40 years old, and the legal industry is just catching up to that. <laughs> yeah, this is like, this is how far in advance we are, right? Like the first thing we did in software was create M4 and then make, right? And now we're bringing that to legal because that's just how it is. Okay, so um, let me show you. I'm going to assume that the resolution on this thing is low enough that I'm not going to give away any secrets. Or maybe, is there anybody here who, is there anybody actually connected to that thing? Um, there's not, but it is recording. <laughs> okay. So. so we're going to turn the screen slightly sideways because I'm going to show you an actual live thing uh, that involves somebody else's company. There's no NDA here, but I assume nobody here really cares about a tiny company in Singapore that is raising its first round. But basically, the way you do this is you go in there. This is Google Spreadsheets. This is your account. You go in and you define all of your entities. This is the stuff that needs to go into any contract. So here's the like here's the address, and here's the name, and here's the passport. I think most business people are comfortable with spreadsheets. And then you go and you define the cap table, which is something that if you're in the investment world, you're probably comfortable with the cap table, right? This is who owns how many shares and how much did they pay for it, and which round did this happen? My software then goes in and parses this cap table. Anybody who's written their own ORDBMS can imagine that this is not that difficult. I just had a couple of MIT interns do this, so they, they got it done well enough. I, I, yeah, I had to teach them some things, but they did it, and it's good. And so this is the cap table, right? And if we need to go do a particular round, like right now these guys are doing their angel round. So a bunch of angels are putting in a bunch of cash. Here's the angel round. Here's the pre-money. Here's how much you're raising. Here's the security that you're using. And here are a bunch of the sort of subsidiary terms. Can you see this? Zoom in. And this is all absolutely standard stuff. You can go out there, you can buy books about this, and then you know what you're doing. Yep. This is the one that we all recommend. And if you read this book, you will understand how to configure the spreadsheet. So not difficult. Uh, what happened a couple of weeks ago was one of the investors in this round said, oh, you guys are using that newfangled YC safe instrument, but I'm not comfortable with the safe. Can we just do a traditional convertible note? And the entrepreneur freaked out because that is the sort of thing that can kill a deal. Because after you, you say, OK, everybody's agreed on the safe, then when you go back to the, to the investor and say, oh, I'm changing the terms, some of the investors will say, oh, OK, well, that gives me the excuse I needed to pull out because I don't actually have the money I need to put in. So I said to this entrepreneur, OK, no problem. You need to go from safe to convertible note click on cell B10 and make exactly that change. And all of these little terms down on the left, some of them become irrelevant, some of them become relevant. Just go convertible note, go up here, and then say generate PDFs. And it goes and it reads the cap table, it reads the entities table, it reads the term sheet table, and it produces a bunch of templates. That's it. This is not like this is not hard, right? This is not what a computer scientist calls a hard problem. Like this is this is very P 
complete. <laughs> but nobody's done it yet. And nobody's done it as an open source project. So far, uh, as far as I can tell, most of what's out there is like fill in the document or fill in the wizard. But it's not like fill in the data structure. And filling the data structure lets you do a whole bunch of stuff that you can't do when you're, when you're doing the traditional way. And one of the things that you can now do is you can visualize the, the different instruments that are in the system. And so we have imported into LegalEase every single early stage standard document that is out there. And we took the opportunity to compare these instruments along the way. Because there's equity instruments, there's preferred. There's warrant type instruments, and then there's debt instruments. And some of them have a cap, no discount. Some of them have no cap, no discount. Some of them have discount, no cap. So you can just put this into like a little dashboard visualization that lets you, at a glance, compare like two different pieces of paper. And you can say, oh, this guy's got like this percent debt, 1x LP. This guy's got no valuation cap. This guy's got a bunch of other stuff with additional rights on top because that's equity. But formalizing your agreement allows you to do all kinds of things that you couldn't have done before. And again, this is not difficult. This is like object-oriented representation of a company, of an investment instrument, of whatever. Just somebody needed to do it. So once you've got that, then you've got um, it, it, this is this is so like obvious that I can't even believe I'm talking about it. But like here's the Here's the actual document. It's XML. And we love, we love XML. This is actually Google Apps Script. So Google Apps Script is scriptable in JavaScript. And they have their own HTML template engine. And I repurposed their HTML template engine to be an XML template engine. And it seems to work just fine. Um, these four different versions of the safe, cap, discount, no cap, no discount, they are now represented in a single XML template. And depending on whether you, I'll show you how to set a document. Yeah, you, can leave, you can leave this one up, that's fine. So uh, here's how you, this is basically a safe now with cap, no discount, right? If we wanted to make it into a discount, no cap, Here's how you do that. That's that. And then now, if you go and compile that, you will get a discount no cap. Because software knows how to read this stuff, right? <laughs> That's all there. And the, the clauses come and go based on what the situation is. This is stuff that lawyers today do all by hand. And really, we should let the software take care of it. It's not hard. There's a bunch of companies out there that, that do do this. So businessintegrity.com, these guys do Contract Express. I'm told it's very good. There's a lot of in-house counsel that you um, Traditional law firms don't use this. It's because it's too efficient. And when you're getting paid 600 bucks an hour, you really don't want to reduce the number of hours so this is the conflict. So these guys are good too. And they've been around for 20 years, right? And so maybe these guys are Photoshop and we are the GIMP. Maybe these guys are Oracle and we are MySQL. Sir? Is it, is it, is it, is it, it seems to me he's not a lawyer. It seems to me that part of why I'm paying $600 an hour, an hour to a lawyer for is to do validation and verification of all this. Um, you know, that seems like the hard. That seems, as a computer scientist, like the hard problem to me is making sure that what comes out of this, you know, is what you want it to 
because yeah. small mistakes in this could mean absolutely. So that like I think that. lawyers are they do a lot of really valuable stuff. They do advisory, they do conflict resolution, they actually explain the law to you and how it applies to your situation. So I'm not saying that this is going to replace all lawyers. All well, I want this to do is like just adjust the draft. Instead of yeah. hand copying boilerplate and filling in every blank like I presumably will do today. Mm -hmm. I run your thing. Don't I pretty much have to go through every place where there was a blank and look, look and make sure that the bad thing hasn't happened? How, how do I get confidence that I don't need to do that? Well, how do you get confidence right now when you use TurboTax to file your taxes? Well, yeah, I don't use TurboTax. <laughs> okay. Well, there's that answer. Yeah. There's the answer sure. that TurboTax, A, the consequences are, for me as an individual, are a lot less. If TurboTax screws up my taxes, it's unlikely to wreck my life or cost me hundreds of millions of dollars. Yep. And uh, B, um, I believe they have a pretty serious, you know, from what little I've read, I believe they have some kind of a serious DMV program. And that's what I guess I'm asking. I'm assuming you have some kind of serious DMV too. I'm just like, no, I don't Well, so I'm not. So this is designed for people who would normally go online and download random crap and then use it, right? And so we are trying to be better than bar, that. Yeah, yes. Sure. So, but we do advise people once you've gotten your thing done, go to a professional and get them to review it, and get their sign off. And if they so don't, so your argument would yeah. just be that the review is going to be faster and cheaper than yeah. doing it from scratch. And some people will decline to do the review because they just. They think they know what they're doing, or yeah. they just would refuse to. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a level one. And, and the other thing to consider is how many errors are introduced by lawyers oh, sure. through oh, the sure. hand, you know, the, the, the bespoke work. You want know, manufacturing it? just works. Uh, <laughs> it totally works. Right? Uh, yeah. But I mean, I guess the argument that I would there again, I don't want to have a long argument, especially in the way you talk. But the the, the point is that. You know, common sense is a powerful thing and a hard thing to capture. You know, right. lawyers are likely to make trivial errors, not, you know, screw the most, maybe less likely to screw up the most important parts than a piece of software that doesn't know which are the most important parts. There you go. Well, yes mm -hmm. and no, but that can iterate too, right? I sure. mean, I think, I think you can, you, can you know, improve the feedback loop, right? Because sure. one, one of the biggest things, one, the, the biggest, one of the biggest issues from my standpoint in legal is, um, lack of a standardized QA process, right? We review each other's work or we might review our own work, but we're not reviewing it against any sort of standard, right? We're reviewing it against our history and our knowledge. So that's where, you know, in other software products like contract standards or KM standards, right, that is mining Edgar databases to look at what different contracts look like, um, sort of using uh, uh, the hive mind to say, okay, well, this is more or less what a you know standard uh, you know executive compensation agreement looks like. The existing UK difference with Turing is that there is no standard. There is no there is no standard. Right. There is, there are guidelines. So right. so yes, as long as you're sticking to stuff that, that as long as the parties think that it's a standard that they've seen it multiple times. But the problem is there's no issuing agency that's going to say, you know, the United States, none of the courts are going to say, this is what this contract looks like and it's supposed to look like. They'll tell you something like, you need to have a signature block. And it's looked at all a set of terms. That's all out in comprehensive language. That's partly true, but I think, you know, to some extent, right, the YC doc stack no. is a de facto standard. Yeah, I'm just not a de jure. I'm, I'm, I'm not I, that's the difference. That's, what I'm yeah, saying. that's right. why you get that respect for feedback because lawyers get conditioned yes. in law school think that that there are these huge consequences and so when we go to like that's the, that's the, the one I, I agree with you it's a great concept i actually think you know i, I and actually the the real dirty secret is what's actually going on and the guy who's throwing six hundred dollars out is not looking at it the guy who's secretary yeah. typed it up and then he's looking at it and he's saying well that's two tenths of an hour i can go so just like pulling out right it just feels like we're back in the bad old days when some people were using Ethernet, some people are using Token Ring, and some people are just inventing their networking protocol as part of the stack because in the 1980s, that's just what you did, right? And eventually, standards emerge and people say, look, we're going to put that in a networking library and we're just going to never write that code ever again. Right. And just another example, that in Washington State, 
the majority of the family court documents in Canada. So we're doing investments for now, but you could see this expanding to other things at some point. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. There's a couple of other interesting things happening right now. So I just want to show you this real quick. So these guys, um, contract standards. Are you guys aware of contract standards? So these guys are trying to be a standard clause library, right? Like. Today, as a programmer, you go on to like Stack Overflow and you copy and paste somebody else's code. Oh. And you can do that for legal clauses now. <laughs> so this is yeah. this is available. Uh, Law Geeks, have you come across that? These guys, uh, you send them your contract and then they tell you what is missing or what seems strange. So they're trying to capture the legal review slice of it. And Common Accord, these guys are probably the most techie thing next to Ethereum right now. And it is so techie that they've got the slash dot interview instead of like the. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole thing like doesn't really work, but you can see how they're they're trying to be very like technical about this. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, the legislation guys. So a couple of arguments around that. Like, first of all, that might actually be a really bad idea because that would be tyrannical. But there are some people who are working in the legislation space. This is just in the markup domain. Uh, these guys came out of Africa, of all places, and they were like, we're going to contribute authoritative XML DTDs for UN parliamentary legislative documents. And the entire UN legislative group was like, hey, that's a really good idea. We should do that. So now there's an oasis group around this based on what these guys did. But it's all just like really flat stuff. It's like italics and clause numbers and dates. It's not the semantic layer. What's the concern about tyranny? Uh, oh, that yeah, yeah, it's like it feels like if you legislate things, then you go by sort of like the book, and then you end up with like an 18 year old boy and a 17 year old girlfriend, right? And then he becomes a sex offender. How do you feel about red light cameras? Yeah. I, I understand. Yeah, I said the role of interpretation law. Yeah. 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 Well, but I mean, that's another general power to be able to be but there is policy and there is drafting. And given, you could argue that given the terrible, terrible state of legislative drafting, there again, the bar is pretty low. You could hardly do worse. Than but the silver lining here is if we do take this formalization approach, right? Yeah. And if we do allow you to unit test your contracts and your law, maybe you could do scenario analysis much more effectively, right? And the investors are interested. They're like, okay, if this company that has already had six rounds of funding exits for $200 million, who gets what, right? They're very interested in those kinds of scenario analysis. And with formal methods, it's really easy to That's answer those questions. For, right? Sorry? That's what MIT interns are for. Well, <laughs> there's a limited finite supply of those. That's, that's exactly what I'm interested right? in on the legislation side. So here's where you say something, okay, you know, the, the um, baby consent thing, but yeah. there's, there's a lot of cases where, you know, there are scenarios where it winds up not being, help, not helping anybody. And if we could, 
close that feedback loop to the yeah. point where you can see people are in the room discussing what the law should be. Yeah. And you can run scenarios and test it and say, okay, this is what. That's right. Work so that's called fuzzing. So we should be able to fuzz the law, right? We should be able right. to fuzz with contracts and fuzz with the law and say, hey, here's a pathological outcome. Did anybody explore this particular execution path? Nobody did. And now let's look at it, right? bigger question with that, though, is, is, is if legislators actually thought like programmers or even institutions, that would actually be great. Yeah. But we just litigated from the Supreme Court the clause uh, in the Affordable Care Act that nobody had paid attention to because it was buried in you know, subclause A and section 4 right. you know, and so on, and, and the entire healthcare system wound up you know, turning on that. So I, I just I think it's a great idea. I just, Something we're struggling to get them to even be able to have this time because everything is in such a time crunch that they just aren't thinking like this. So they don't run those scenarios because they can't get their thinking themselves enough time. Yep. Then let's go all the way to the world. But isn't there room to capture 5%, 10%? No, I'm, not, right? I'm not saying we should be working on it out. Yeah, just start somewhere. Okay. That's, so that's why they have, you know, that's what they do now through staffers and analytical branches and that. Yeah, but I mean, you do run an analysis, you run a fiscal impact statement. Uh, a legal impact statement. You run it by the, the income counsel, but I agree with you. What they can't do is they, because of the limitations of freedom and independence, they didn't start. Yeah. If you can have computational theorem improving, maybe we can have like better computational law that just explores these cases, right? Just like Wouldn't walk you have through. Wouldn't formalize the entire system in the legal body and just pull that off? Yeah, you gotta start like start with small chunks. Hard to Web browsers don't even work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're trying to tell me that you can formally parse the entire body of American law? No. You're trying to tell you can parse some tiny section of some particular thing. Um, yeah. That's that's contract. Contract. Exactly. And that's yeah. so that's what we've got exactly here, right? Yeah. So this is the Singapore company's law, but it basically says if you want to issue shares, you got to go talk to your existing shareholders and get approval, right? Like that's the really simple stuff. That's a dependency graph, and I in fact have a dependency graph that spits out the appropriate documents needed to Turn all of that true. To so, certify that all of that happened. Hmm? To certify that all of that yeah. happened. Yeah. And this is stuff that your corporate secretary does, and they know how to do it because they have 10 years' experience. So let's, let's improve that. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, yeah, I know you're not leaving really because you're, you disagree, no, but. Good. Yeah. So, essentially, working on making the contract. So you start out with sort of a set of rules and templates that generate some text, right? And you also use those rules in execution situations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's actually what I what I want to get to. I want to get to formalizing it enough to the point that we can. Uh, so right now this is just like a flat thing, but I want to allow people to write these things in a formal language and I want to write a compiler that does natural language generation and compiles from your formal language to English and then you've got this backward compatibility layer that allows traditional lawyers to read it and debug the sort of output and then you've got the formal layer which is also forward compatible to things like Ethereum Ethereum is this smart contract thing which plugs into the blockchain and they're very excited about this because they're like, now we can have self-executing contracts that automatically take money out of your Bitcoin wallet when certain things happen. And I'm like, I don't know if that's a good idea, but somebody had to go prove that, right? <laughs> it's going to be great for some people. It seems like the sort of thing that you would expect, but once you remove the, the priesthood that is a barrier to people being able to do law and, and, and this, this threshold where I'm only going to do law, I'm only going to use the legal system if it's worth, you know, this much money to me. Um, the way that tech tends to blow up is that it gets cheap and small and you start using it for things that people have been for for before. And yep. two people will have, a, you know, a, a very small agreement that they don't want to have between them that you wouldn't bother with a contract for today. You know, if you could just toss something off the smartphone app that's rigorous, yep. that's that's disruptive. That would be very cool. And that's, I think this will enable that. Is anybody working applying the same idea to regulation? Does regulation look a lot like 
I don't know. Yeah, that's that's not my that's not where we started, but it sounds like it certainly should. Um, in some ways, it yeah. might be easier. I mean, I think regulation, the, the codification of regulation, sometimes is more because a lot of regulation is written more professionally rather than legislation, which is written by legislators. Well, uh, by people. <laughs> <laughs> the legislators sort of fight with the rocks. Yeah, there's right. no legislators. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, because it's in the power district. So you've got power contracts and power markets that is bilateral contracts mm -hmm. then you've got this whole body of regulation that says what you're allowed to do and you're not allowed to do you know? and all that ends up getting executed by the software that right. controls the power system right you mentioned zero improvements earlier are you aware i assume you're ethically aware of what the hall guys and the intel guys are doing with actual oh so there's there's been a bunch of papers i okay. need to go find references for you probably for, please yeah um, for the academic community got into this, and this idea you were just talking about, this idea of saying, well, let's develop a formal language for specifying contracts, and let's be able to do things like validate, you know, contracts against, you know, specifications for various properties and that kind of thing. There's a bunch of that stuff out there, and a lot of it was done with zero improvement and all these mechanisms. So it's not a new thing, I think. But a lot of it's been kind of under the yeah. yeah, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and the thing about if you had a formal representation of regulation, then you could treat it as a constraints problem and then find some creative ways to. <laughs> exactly. Well, it doesn't fix it. It turns out that, you know, if you build the language right, the way the DSLs are built these days, it doesn't have, you don't have to be that creative to do some pretty cool stuff with it and sort of everybody kind of uses zero and some of things. Um, I guess. I mean, yeah. obviously nobody's fielded this yet. Yeah, I'd love to see the papers yeah, or any research that's happening on that. The Galois guys, you know the Galois no, no, how do you spell that? Oh, G A L O I S. It's a bigger in town that does all the whole market stuff. It has a bunch of people who would know exactly what you are. Great. Right. Galois yeah. Portland should be the area. Yeah, there you go. Galois Asia. That could be cool. Yeah, they're named after that other thing. It's <laughs> good. It's good. There was a proposal a long time ago. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, this is different from that. This is actually aimed specifically at contract law. I, I, there was a whole thread of papers about five years ago. That this is aimed at specifically at contract law, and it was specifically aimed at um, building the contract in a way such that you could formally check proper contract properties with your improver, but like you say, but still the contracts were in a language that could be translatable to English for any kind of degree. That was the point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think this, I've seen you, some of the papers. Do you have like an example of a formal structured way to change things in natural language? Um, we're Is working on that now. That what do you mean? Oh, oh um, yeah. yeah, we, um, This is kind of one approach. So these are computable contracts. This is finance. I don't know if he has a, an example in here. This may be too academic to have an example. But I know um, Nick Zabo has it. But he none of these guys have done a compiler, because that would be really nice. I'm working on the compiler. But he's got the pseudocode and he's got the idea. We can all see where this is going to go. This is just DSL. Do you, do you see all this moving in the direction of composability ultimately? I mean, it's very, very kind of uh, not very specific right now. Yeah, I, I think so. Like, Common Accord uh, is one attempt to, you can see how they're, they're trying to turn this into. And contract standards is the other model. So they've got this huge clause library. And they even have different versions of each clause. You can say, ah, let's add that. And here are some examples out of Edgar. So this is just like a one-time thing, right? You get the mapping done. 
turn your AST into a bunch of text. If, Computational I'm, linguistics. I'm still thinking that if there's some guy in a startup who wants to do this and he fills out the Google Doc sheet, well, he's still going to be calling me for a cup of coffee and BS saying, what does this all mean? Yeah. You could tell him, go read the book. Read Brad Feld's book. Yeah. Or whatever. Or not. I mean, right. that might be a very valid use of a few hundred dollars to hire a lawyer. Yeah. To explain it to you. Well, that's, I think, one of the epic open questions, right? Is it end up being cheaper to have the attorney who's sending you all this stuff? Or does it end up cheaper to have him do his whole pull together boilerplate process at the end of the day? Yeah, I think that's yeah. really what it comes I don't, to. I'm not saying I know the answer. I just need to do it. Well, I, I know that every lawyer, almost every lawyer in the country would tell you the latter is true, right? You can't get a lawyer to review your legal team for application. They will tell you that throw it in the trash and let me use my counsel. Yeah. Right? Um, but that doesn't mean that it's the right approach. Well, or even the more efficient. The, 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 the other side of that argument argue that that's with the legal zoom will specific fault rather than, you know, maybe it's just so terrible that really you shouldn't be using that. For well, and that's part of it, right? And so to the extent that you're going against, uh, again, a, 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 an approved doc tag like YC or like the clause library coming from KM standards, which is mining the edge of databases, and basically the lawyers can't argue with that, right? right. A lawyer can make well, a valid argument, yeah. <laughs> or, or believes they can make a good argument against legal zoom right now, but it gets a lot more challenging to say, okay, I can't, you know, this, this is what, you know, 90 You don't want your term sheet to look like yeah. YCs. Yeah. That would be wrong. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I think it also kind of goes to the, uh, the lowest common denominator effect of legal zoom, which is they're trying to go into all 50 states, maybe a little bit of customization even. But, you know, so and, and I'm, I'm coming at it from a, a different point of view. I, I work in-house very early stage. And when I'm sitting around, phone's not ringing, I create my own templates. And, and so I think, that, I mean, it's great. In fact, one of my first jobs was because a guy, he got tens of thousands of dollars and spent almost all of that on legal fees. Right. And, and then I called him the next day, and he's like, you're hired. But uh, I think there's definitely a place for it, especially early stage. But when you when you get up to like 60, 70 shareholders with different interests, then then uh, I mean I, I really like the the cap table aspect of it and some of those basic rules. But then you, you get into you know some people are within it themselves and some people are Perkins Cooley in there, and and wow the money waters just they they always. Uh, reason that the lawyer first person I should face, you know, the, the, the current resistance is who, who's going to get sued for malpractice? The software guy is not going to get sued for malpractice. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's that's the other thing that happens. And that's that's where this really is a tool for for lawyers too. I think not just for the drafting, um, the, the founders drafting it themselves, where it, 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 it's efficiency on their end, and it's the same efficiency that the founders would be paying for, but they can make sure it's right from the get-go, have maybe even annotations in it if it's a Google Doc that explains it and, and just, uh, you know, has that extra little something right from the beginning that making sure it's properly designed um, right from the start. Yeah, I think that that's going to be a little bit, uh, uh, so I've worked with a couple of company founders and when they started out, they, they, they were starting out, they didn't know what's going on. You know, they progress to the chairs, mm -hmm. and then they can read a document just as well as they need the lawyer. And then they just don't have time for it, so then they hire a lawyer to get them on the field. But I think there's something in the beginning where they're filling out a form, checking a bunch of boxes, and they end up with something that is, you know, 20 pages long, and they don't want to read. Uh, and then they just go. And, and then the, the, the challenge is really getting the idea across what what is it that they have in their hand? There's a funny tension between perceived competence and the documents or you know, the, the legal outcome and actual competence, right? And I think we're yeah. in this, this mix where you, you, the degree of perceived competence when you have your lawyer working on it is high, 
but that doesn't necessarily correlate to actual quality. Right. You, you know, I think that if you could turn this into a platform, then you basically shop it to the, 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 the firms and say, you give me your boilerplate, I'll put it in here. And then you, you create the, the tool. I've, like, I've worked with a couple of accountants that, that, that do something like that, where you become sort of a software as a service or a platform, uh, and they can speed data. I mean, there's a, there's a few law firms out there that are going to be the white glove, top four, you know, glass and stainless steel that charge $600 an hour. But there's a lot of people out there who... Uh, yeah, so we've had law firms approach us on exactly that point, and they've said, we want to be the guys who give you the templates mm -hmm. so that when the user needs review, they're going to ask, who should we get review? And we, they get sent to that law firm. Right. right. So one interesting question the whole approach raises for me is when we're talking about these giant documents and these billion you know, lines of terrible stuff to review, I mean, a lot of that's there to make the boilerplate modular. A lot of it is there not because in the specific situation with the specific document that you're trying to make, you, you believe it's going to be important, but because it might be important in somebody's document somewhere someday. And an interesting question I think that your stuff raises is if I've got a good formal description of exactly what this document needs to do, you know, can I produce a very short, very first document that still does all the important legal things? Yeah. Like the config that, file then, stays the same, and then the output changes. Right, the output, but if the output changes <laughs> yeah. to be, you know, one page instead of twenty, all of a sudden everybody's confidence in it. You know, I know that's a that's a okay. technologist fantasy statement, but um, but now you know now everybody's confidence in it's going to be a lot higher just because they can actually see what it does and doesn't do. Right. Um, yeah. Well, that that is actually the case in in some of these um, fundings that we've done. It's a relatively short term sheet that summarizes the relatively long subscription agreement right right I mean, that's the point of it yeah so yeah but the, the question is could the is the subscription agreement itself have to be still relatively long or could it be shortened too right given that you know what is and isn't in it And your claim is that it's not, if you don't have this clause in the contract at this time, it's just plain as you don't have this clause. So every contract yeah. ever written by anybody everywhere needs to have this severability clause, and it doesn't matter what it's for, it doesn't matter who's going to be executed. You need a severability clause. Yeah. Well, I mean, severability clause is arguable respectfully, but there's no way yeah. yeah. that's fair. The, the key terms that always show up are there because you've got this body of case law saying, Here's what happens to you if you don't put this yeah. in. Yeah, and like you, like you said earlier, the, the if, even if even if it doesn't turn out to be that true, and you actually look at the, you know, actual precedent and stuff, the law school says everybody knows. Well, well, it's really obvious. Okay, we we as lawyers, we think of it in terms of the absolute pay of outcomes of the court, because that's what what we think in terms of it. Because the overwhelming number of the agreements are not going to be. So yeah, do they, does every single one of them need this overkill? Not in a, any sort of like predictive sense, but that's not the reason that you're doing it. You're doing it because you want that insurance policy because right. you're probably just, you know, the whole thing is an overestimation of what you need to engage in. Yeah, it's like, yeah. it's the difference between programming and software engineering, well, right? Programming, you expect it to go well, and then software engineering, 90% of your code is yeah, exception handling. I think you, if, if you take a step back, one of the reasons for a big long agreement is to stay out of court and to get a summary judgment. So if anything conceivable happens, that case has been taken care of in the agreement and we've agreed to it but then that kind of leads into oh well then you attack the agreement you try to get that knocked out the rigor and things like that so you can have a, a, a sales contract that's a page long and jack in the ucc but then if that goes wrong then that's that's you, know, you got a bunch of attorneys that are arguing over codified law in the u.s which is going to be a nightmare itself. but i think just like in software what you have to acknowledge is that you are paying a price for that insurance policy. The price yeah. you're paying is literally a dollar price. Your, your contract is now much more expensive yeah. to, to produce and, and maintain. 
And you know, you're playing a risk price in it, just as if your software is 90% error handling, probably the error handling bugs are way more, way worse than the bugs <laughs> in the actual thing we're gonna be. Um, you have the same kinds of problems here where you get enough terrible boilerplate in there. You may end up with something that's actually just you when you get started. Yeah, but hopefully, yeah. And if that happens, right, the, the open source approach comes and saves you because we learn collectively from any one bug. And right now, if a lawyer does a review, and they're like, oh, we got to change this thing and that thing. Yeah. That just happens for that one contract, yeah. right? Well, and that happens in the legal world, too. Right. It's like when one of your comrades gets disbarred for making a mistake, you get that in the bar journal, sort of. Yeah, it's not quite the same. It rises to that level. Yeah. <laughs> when a law firm gets sued out of existence because they screwed up a patent file, yeah, yeah. everybody needs to be Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we will not screw it up that <laughs> but Wouldn't it be nice if like, yeah. the feedback loop could just be like, oh, well, there's the pull request, and yeah. from now on, everything just has that patch? Well, yeah, yeah I was going to say, I mean, there's, there's a funny form of technical debt that arises in all of the boilerplate that Right, and, mm -hmm. and there's never, there's rarely an actual cleanup yep. effort. Yeah. yeah. Really. So I think about the number of like, so this just came up over the weekend. Think about the number of, of condo like bylaws, oh. right? Oh and then oh. gay marriage comes along, <laughs> and then you need to go patch all those bylaws. Right. <laughs> That's not happening, right? Yeah. So. Well, and not even proactive, much less retroactively, right? I mean, we're not even right. fixing it going forward, much less going back to the body of the existing contract. We don't even fix it until the next contract. Comes right, out. but you can imagine <laughs> a situation where when you've used yeah. software to compile the contracts yep, and you now have, you know, new information, yep. exceptions, whatever, you've got a report. You've got a report, exactly. Yep. And you, you, you can even go back and say, yeah, if the software could conceivably in our fantasy world actually have a process, you know, now initiate a process. Oh yeah, you know, the, we found a bug in this contract. You two have to execute these two documents to really clean this thing up. So you better go do that, right? right. Yeah. And we're used and to that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. In software, it's like, download yeah. the service pack. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it makes sense that a lawyer makes that decision. Right, right. It's like absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, maybe we don't want to send that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. No. So, well, so we just decision, the, the, the right. make the decision whether to send. whether to do that or not. But yeah. at least it can yeah. offer a process if you decided it was ethically important, right? Um, well, the, the other side of that coin is if someone else sees the bug report. Exactly. Yep. Now, you, 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 you just say to the other side, "Hey, we screwed up." Yeah. Yeah. Here's your well, choice. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time I've had to send an email like, you know, <laughs> we forgot. <laughs> talk about something. <laughs> yeah, you're really, you're really really right. yeah. You really don't, they don't call you on it. Yeah. Walk away. Right? And sometimes yeah. you see it and you're like, well, I can't possibly reopen this agreement for this thing that I missed. Yeah, absolutely. And you let it go. No, oh, if I, if, like, a lot of times I've had people call up and say, well, you know, this agreement, it's, we, we thought about it and it just isn't good for us. So can we just have a different <laughs> can they do that? Yeah. Well, well, I think I think they, 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 yeah. Yeah, sure. If you want to say yes, and a lot of times it turns out it's like, okay, why not? We'll just scrap it and redo it. Yeah. But the other thing that's interesting about the, this legalese.io layer, right, is that you can modify the natural language to fit some of that. So if you've got a client that has a particular, you know, branding interest in producing terms of service agreements that read uh, in a more hip way than coming you know, up, you still, you know, you might have a, a, a hipster English library versus a, you know, old guy's English library, and you're still producing basically the same contract. Yeah, I, I have run into that where the marketing department says, oh, can we use marketing friendly terms? Like, no, we can't do that. Well, or, because yeah. if we do, then, you know, we, I mean, working with what I do, ultimately going for some sale for a lot of money, there's going to be a due diligence from some high-priced law firm, and they're going to look at all the agreements, and they're going to be like, none of these right. things match up. Right. But even then, right, so downstream, so, you've got a defined library, due diligence all of a sudden. But you know, one of the things I, I do like, in, in that, and I don't know if this is what, what it does, but like I, I use SharePoint list, everything's on 
SharePoint. And then I decide, well, you know, I've got seven different kinds of sale agreements. I gotta change the warranty section. I have to go into the, all the warranty sections are the same, but I have to go to each word document and change it. And then that's like Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Now if I could just populate I could have the warranty section that goes across each and go through and check boxes and stuff, and it just auto populates from different areas, so I just do one. Yep, that's how this works. We got includes, right? You're talking about an include with parameters on it. That's mm -hmm. exactly what we have. We've got an include function <laughs> with parameters on it. So the level it exists currently is basically a smart template. Right now, it's, it's a smart template. It is M4, yeah. but we're working on the compiler, yeah. and we'll get there. Like that's one of the hard challenges. So if you happen to know anyone who is like really good at uh, compilers, maybe like a CompSci grad student who loves this stuff, please let me know because that's the fun part, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody in, in NLP today is like starting with natural language and trying to extract semantics from it. And I'm like, look, guys, I've got a problem that's a hundred times easier. <laughs> well, in a way, um, yeah. as the as we used to say, I mean, there is this third approach, right, which is sort of the traditional approach to this kind of thing, which is sort of the COBOL approach, right? You try and provide a formal language, which nonetheless can be read and understood by, you know, informal parties. And I think it's a failure, the bankruptcy of that approach, after a whole bunch of tries at it, for meeting these people to try one of these other two approaches. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. They're both hard. They're both really AI complete. Maybe. It is hard. <laughs> but as a programmer, I just believe that I want people who are like me to be able to write contracts without having to go pay somebody who has that special license. So we are going to get in trouble the way Uber and Airbnb have gotten in trouble. I think I see that coming. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, it's like somebody wanted to edit their photos and then they install like a vector program instead of a raster program. Mm -hmm. They're not happy about that. You know, that's, well, that's the, the difference is that they rarely lose their job and uh, future livelihood over that. It's true. Mistake. True. All of these things do happen. So, I, that's part of my it's an issue. I don't. I don't. I don't have good answers for that. <laughs> well, let's focus on the cool technical problem of doing natural language generation. <laughs> let's build a compiler. Yeah, yeah. I just, again, yeah. you know, I, I try to tell you, I just, I just 
still frustrated with the work and stuff. And it's like just the first people on the way that you're just yeah. free. Sure. That's how our whole, our whole condition is. Yeah. Uh, this yeah. somewhere down the line is going to bite somebody in the butt. Yeah, it's like a, a London cab driver saying, you know, what if your GPS goes offline? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but people take that risk, right? So anyway, I think that's that's all I have to share. Does anybody else want to share anything else or say anything? I think I've gone through all this material. No, thank you. Yeah. Really Good. Well, thank you. Yeah, if you can uh, help me figure out a revenue model, I'd be really grateful. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, I might be able to. Okay. I think that there, because uh, that's pretty much all I've been doing is working with startup companies. And, you know, when they first start out, two guys in a garage, they can't afford anything. And I've seen a couple of things in this town where a law firm will say, we'll give you credit. Yeah. And then that credit goes away pretty quick. Yeah. And then in Oregon, uh, until you pay the bill, 